Now, back in 1990, there was a highway called Highway 80, which joined Iraq to Kuwait, a highway which had been used by the Iraqi forces to invade Kuwait. Now, in response to this invasion, after a series of UN resolutions, a large coalition force led by the United States began Operation Desert Storm to expel the Iraqis from Kuwait. The coalition forces were very successful. After a five-week aerial bombing campaign, it took just five days for the coalition forces to liberate Kuwait with minimal coalition losses. One of the enduring images for me, and perhaps for some of you who were around at that time from that war, was what happened on Highway 80. As the Iraqi forces were trying to escape from Kuwait back to Iraq, on the highway, over a thousand vehicles were destroyed by US combat aircraft. And this road, as a result, came to be known as the Highway of Death. Now imagine for a moment being caught up in such carnage. But the Bible warns us that there's an even worse destination in store for those who are heading in the wrong direction in life. The Bible tells us that life is like a journey. For some people, the journey is long. For others, it is short. But no matter how long your journey ends up being, what matters isn't the length of time spent on the road, but what direction you're heading in. The Bible tells us that there are only two directions that we can take on the road of life. You're either travelling towards God or you're going the other way, travelling away from God. And depending on your direction, the road of life is either the way of salvation or a highway leading to hell. The way of salvation is the way of wisdom rather than the way of foolishness. And Solomon describes for us the way of wisdom in verses 1 to 4 in our passage here in Proverbs 7. The way of wisdom involves keeping God's words, treasuring up his commandments in our hearts. It involves keeping God's word because following God's word is the way of life. And as we respond positively to God's word, we will live. As we keep on following God's word, the life in him that we currently experience will blossom into the fullness of eternal life when Jesus returns. That's the promise that God gives us. Now Solomon tells us in verse 2 that we need to keep God's law like the apple of our eye or like the pupil. The pupil is the black hole in the centre of our eyes that lets the light in so that we can see. So to keep God's law as the pupil of our eye means that we need to have God's law as the most important thing in our life. Just as we cherish and protect the person who's the apple of our eye, so we're to cherish God's word and to keep it. Solomon also tells us that the way of wisdom involves God's commandments being bound on our fingers. The content of God's truth needs to be wrapped around our fingers so that whatever we do is guided by God's life giving word. And someone also tells us that God's commandments need to be written on the tablet of our hearts. Here our hearts are pictured as a tablet of stone upon which the key beliefs and moral principle of God's word are to be inscribed. And friends, As Solomon tells us about these things, we have the opportunity this morning to look at ourselves in the light of that. Are you the kind of person that Solomon is describing here? Are you the kind of person who loves God's revelation? Are you seeking every day to have more and more of God's word in the Bible inscribed in your heart and incorporated into your way of thinking and how you live? We need to be in a close relationship with God's word. 
Solomon says that wisdom should be like our sister. We need to have wisdom involved in our life, there protecting us. He tells us that understanding should be like a close relative. So I ask you the question, is the wisdom and understanding that comes from God's word an intimate part of your everyday life? It needs to be. Because Satan is out there tempting to take us away from the pathway of salvation. Now we might know God, we might be following Jesus, but the Bible warns us that it's possible for believers, if they're not careful, to fall away from the true path. Satan wants to stop us reaching our ultimate destination. He's out there seeking to use whatever means at his disposal to seduce us away from following Jesus. And friends, one of the ways that Satan can seduce us is through sexual immorality. Now the growth of sexual immorality throughout the Western world since the so-called sexual revolution in the 1960s, when you think about it, is a form of idolatry. People have replaced the proper worship of God with the worship of human flesh and beauty. Instead of seeing sex as a gift from God that is meant to be used in a way that God decrees, our society sees sex as what we live for or as the key to meaning or as a means for making money. And this is also one of the reasons why we need to have God's word inscribed in our hearts. Because, as Solomon says in verse 5, wisdom can keep us safe from sexual immorality and in particular from adultery. Now looking through Proverbs so far, we've seen a number of different kinds of foolish actions mentioned. But prominent among those is the folly of adultery. We've seen Solomon mention this already in chapters 2, 5 and 6. And now in chapter 7, Solomon speaks about the same problem again. You get the impression that adultery is a particularly stupid thing to get involved in. Solomon seems to be emphasising it here. And he goes on to talk about a situation that if we're not careful, we can fall into. In verses 6 through to 23... Solomon gives an account of one instance of stupidity involving adultery. It's something that he observed looking down from the window of his house. As he looked down there, he saw a crowd of idiots. Back then as now, when you see a crowd of idiots, it's normally a crowd of young men. I hate to say that, but for some reason it's normally males. I guess it's because they've got the testosterone pumping through their veins but they lack common sense. They have a need to prove their manhood, often through feats of physical strength or sexual prowess. They like to think they're cool, but often they're just plain stupid. Idiots, really. And among the people that Solomon saw, among the boys there, Solomon spied one guy in particular who lacked sense. There he was, strolling through the marketplace. And he came to the corner of the public square and turned up the road, heading in the wrong direction. It was at twilight. The sun was setting and darkness wasn't just coming upon the town, but one foolish young man was about to step over to the dark side. And as he walked along the road, a woman was waiting waiting to seduce him. She came forward. She was wearing the garb of a prostitute. But there was something of a dark secret in her heart. We're told that this woman was a lady who played things loose. Instead of being gentle and quiet and respectful of her husband, this woman was loud and rebellious. She had itchy feet. She always wanted to go outside. And so you'd see her outside, at times in the street, at times in the public square, loitering at the street corner, waiting. Waiting for an opportunity to find some idiot that she could seduce. And so she came out and grabbed hold of the young man 
and kissed him. She was forward, brazen, and this was the opportunity that she had been waiting for, waiting in ambush, just like a lioness waiting for its prey. And notice her words of seduction in verses 14 through the 20. I've just fulfilled my vows, so I have meat to eat. So I've come out to look for you, and I've found you. You sort of wonder here, is the meat the meat of the sacrifice she had at home, or is this guy going to end up being the meat who is going to be eaten on this particular occasion? And her seductive words continued. My bed, it's already prepared. There are nice clean sheets made of the best coloured linen from Egypt, perfume with myrrh, aloes and cinnamon. Come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's have fun together. Don't worry about my husband. He's not at home. He's gone on a long business trip and won't be back until the middle of the month. Friends, what we have here is seduction. Seduction, plain and simple. An invitation for this young man to commit sin. And the young man in question couldn't resist. He was led astray by her seductive words. He couldn't resist what was coming from her lips. And so he followed her. Now this young guy, he probably thought, ah, this forbidden pleasure, it's now mine for the rest of the night. And who knows for how long beyond. But it's not quite as simple as that, is it? Now our society might like to think that sex is just consenting adults expressing love or providing a moment of pleasure for each other. If they agree to it, who are we to say that they should or shouldn't? It's a free country. What consenting adults do in the privacy of their own bedroom is up to them. It's none of your business. That's what our society might say. And true, it might not be any of our business personally, but what about God? What about the God who created you and who has given you life and who gave you your sexual function for a reason? Does the one who made you not have the right to tell you how you should use the gifts that he's given you? From God's perspective, this wasn't just a bit of fun going down between the two individuals involved. In going across and being seduced, in following this woman to do the deed, that young man may have had a smile on his face, but he failed to see the bigger picture. In reality, he was like an ox going to the slaughter, like a lamb about to be bound, like a deer being hunted, and on the verge of feeling the hunter's arrow piercing through its liver. Like a bird darting into a trap, this foolish guy wasn't aware that his very life was in danger. In verses 24 through to 27, Solomon warns us about the need to avoid such foolishness. My sons, listen to me and pay attention to what I say. Don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray into her paths. We've seen Solomon warn us a number of times already in the book of Proverbs. Stay away from adultery. Applying this to us today, living in a world where sexual immorality abounds and remembering how Jesus taught that lusting after others in our heart can also constitute a form of adultery, we need to make sure that we don't get seduced by the ways of the world around us. We've already seen in Proverbs 5 that if we have a sexual drive, then any sexual thoughts that we have need to be focused exclusively on our husband or wife if we're married or on our future husband or wife if not yet married. In sum, if we're not married to the person in question, we shouldn't be lusting after them, fantasising about them or ogling their flesh. Sure, 
I acknowledge, in our day and age, it's often on display. These days you don't have to go far to see highly sexual images. You don't have to do much to arrange some kind of hookup. And you might even have friends or acquaintances who are into that way of life. But friends, that's not a good enough reason for you to join them. You've got to see the seduction for what it is. There's more at stake than just a few moments of harmful pleasure. Solomon warns us in verse 26 that much, much more is at stake here. If you give into illicit seduction, you're not cool. You're not free. You won't be fulfilled. You're a victim. You just join the list of all the other foolish people in the world who have been taken down, killed in battle at the hands of seduction. Solomon tells us in verse 27 that the house of an adulteress is a highway leading to hell. And the location where the illicit affair takes place is a room of death. Now friends... Living in the world today, we shouldn't be surprised to find Satan trying to seduce us through some form of inappropriate sexual activity. He takes the sexual drive that's good, as created by God, and then seeks to twist it and divert it into a direction that leads to our spiritual destruction, with the added benefit of harming other people at the same time. So don't fall for the ruse. Don't give in to illicit seduction. Don't travel on the highway to hell. Don't put the promise of eternal life in danger in exchange for just a few moments of fleeting pleasure. Now I remember a former student of mine. After dropping out of his studies for a while, he came back to college and one day... He came up to me and told me about a struggle that he was having with sexual immorality. And it was pretty serious. I asked him a few questions, trying to get at his motivation for this particular behaviour. We had a good discussion, but I remember saying to him, you know, in the end, it comes down to whether or not you believe God's promise. Are you prepared to believe that God will give you everything that you need? Are you prepared to believe that God will give you the fullness of eternal life? Or are you willing to put what God has promised you in danger by going after a few moments of pleasure? You need to look at the bigger picture and see this temptation for what it is. It's Satan offering you a few moments of pleasure in exchange for eternal life. That's not worth it. Now in the end, I don't know how this student fared. But I fear he gave in to the temptation. For I haven't heard from him since. But what about you? Are you going to laugh off all of this as being old-fashioned or impractical for the world that we live in today? Or are you willing to stake your life and your sexual fulfilment on the word of God who created you? Do things his way, not the way of your friends or society around about you. Fill your heart with the truth of God's word and God's way of life instead of titillating your brain with the impurity of the world around you. Now it's my hope and prayer that for all of us here today, God will give us the wisdom to walk carefully upon the road that leads to life, rather than to travel mindlessly on the highway to hell. Make sure you're not a victim of seduction.